So. I don't do first consultations in any form. If you have a question, you should post it on Piazza. You can do it anonymously. And uh, I will answer it to the best of my ability. Um, okay. All right, so I don't mind doing it on Zoom, but I guess really, so for the second midterm, I may have a conflict and it's not guaranteed yet, but it's something that I don't have any control over and I won't know until closer to the date. But like, I'm genuinely concerned that I won't be able to take the midterm at its scheduled time. And I was wondering if it would be possible for me to take it earlier or later in the day, or just talk to you about it as the date gets closer, or like ask my TA if you would be willing to proctor me at a separate time. It's not about TA, it's not about proctoring, because these exams all take place online, and because all uh, exam exams will be uh, in electronic, electronic format, there will no way to secure the content of the exam if it's taken on another day, another another time. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. that, that's why in this situation there is no option. Uh, if it would have been a different uh, uh, you know, format, usually it would be possible to give a student a paper exam and uh, proctor it. But in this situation it's just physically impossible to make sure and no matter if uh, someone gives any promises, I cannot rely on promises. I only can rely on a concrete specific situations. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I strongly recommend not doing that. Well, no, I mean, like my, obviously my first choice is like not missing it. Like I'd rather take it when it's scheduled, um, but it was just like a backup plan because I don't know if I will have the conflict or not. Like it's not in my control. Um. Well, there's uh, there are certain uh, certain well issues, elements, features, which may be out of our control, and uh, if that is out of your control, making up exams is out of my control. Mm -hmm. You need to know for sure, and you need to make your mind. Well, I just don't know what to do. Like, what do you suggest I do? Well, if you can't take an exam, you have to drop this class. No, I can't. I paid three thousand dollars for the course, and I do like the course. Like, I don't want the one conflict to be the reason I don't take the course. Like, I've had how much? How much did you pay for this? Back. How much did you pay for the course? Three thousand one hundred dollars. They raise the price. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And like I've had other professors in physics and you're honestly like the best one, like even though it's remote, like you taught me more 105 material than my actual 105 physics professor. And I would really well, like, um, uh, like, I, mean, I need to discuss this with my superior. I cannot make a decision. Okay, that's so I can do that, and um, you will have to let me know as soon as possible your situation. Mm -hmm. I can promise you that I will have that discussion, and what they say, that I cannot promise you, okay? Mm -hmm. If they say fine, I'll do it. I, f I will find a way, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, thank you so much. All right, next question. Um, okay, so... And I need to, just in case, send the link, because I know that some students may don't remember that it's always the same link, so I just want to post it on Piazza. And uh, just a second. Uh, what do I want to do? I want to know on this. Hours now. Link. By the way, can you see a screen or it's fuzzy? 
Um, it's a little fuzzy. Yeah. If it's fuzzy, you need to tell me. I, I can fix it. Oh. All right. Ah, one more thing. I need to open a pro uh, website. Just in case. <clears throat> Is the screen better now? Um. Yeah, I think it's clear. I think it's just zoomed out. It, 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 it sometimes it comes out of focus, and uh, when I know, I can just uh, go. All right. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> Let's uh, do talk physics. Please ask a question. So my first question is regarding the electroscope. So I understand what the charges would look like on an electroscope if you do it through induction or if you physically have like rubbing. Yes. If I just bring a conductor in contact with an electroscope and then move it completely away, would the charges on that base um, be whatever charges I transferred over, or would the entire in electroscope have the same charges throughout? You uh, assume that you're bringing a charged conductor. Mm -hmm. Positive or negative? Choose one. Negative. So it has extra electrons. And if you now touch, some of these electrons will run onto the electroscope because they will have some room and they repel each other. And when you then remove this connection, some of those extra electrons will remain on the electroscope and it will remain charged. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, so that would be the same thing as rubbing the... the yes. Okay. You see, if it's the conductor, conductor, electrons, even if you just touch, electrons can run easily. But if it's insulator, in that case, you kind of need to move it, uh, scratch them off, move them back and forth. A little bit. Okay, I see. Um, so if it just touched it and it was an insulator, that top plate would have positive charges. Well, basically, no. Uh, if, if it would have been an insulator and you just touch it, some very, very small amount of electrons might be moved one way or another, but it would be so small amount that it wouldn't make any difference, basically. We wouldn't we would not see any deflection. Okay. Okay. Yes. Next question. Um, okay. So, for insulators, they can be polarized and they can charge through induction. It would just happen over a long time, right? Like, it would need, they would need a lot of time and energy to do that, right? Well, if you have an insulator, and uh, if you just bring bring another charge charged insulator and touch or even scratch, does it make much difference? It might might make a little bit of difference in this location, but that's it. If you want to make some difference, you have to apply a strong electric field, relatively strong electric field, and this electric field polarizes molecules inside. It. Each molecule, molecule uh, becomes like a like an uh, oval in shape because electrons will well an electron is negatively charged so force acting on each electron will point opposite to electric field so it kind of moves electrons a little bit away from a positive nucleus. Oh, so the only way to polarize an insulator is to apply a strong electric field to cause the charges to separate. Move away as, as, from each other a little bit. Yes, it is a separation, but it is not like a separation in, in a conductor. These electrons, they cannot run away. They still stick to the same nucleus. They just uh, shift a little bit away in one direction. The symmetry is broken, and now this becomes a dipole. 
But this dipole is not an actual physical dipole with two chargers and a stick. There is no stick. If you remove electric field, they become back, you know. So this uh, dipole was neutral and remains neutral. But when it's slightly too kind of elongated, like an oval, now this polarization creates its own electric field. Because what you do, basically, you now observing a lot of these dipoles inside. Each has uh, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus. So each has an electron shifted away from a nucleus. And that makes like a layer, negatively charged layer, mm -hmm. and a positively charged layer. Well, but you have similar dipoles all the way through the dielectric. So these, which are close to each other, they basically neutralize <clears throat> each other. And what you have in the end, just certain surface charge on one side and some surface charge on another side. And these two layers now generate their own induced electric field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so can you charge an insulator through induction? No. Charging by induction involves a step when you touch it to remove, let's say, extra electrons. But uh, for that, it has to be a con conductor. If you touch an insulator, it doesn't make any difference practically. Okay. Um, um, so when we were talking about discharging objects, we always talked about using conductors to discharge an object. An object, can you theoretically use an insulator to discharge an object? Theoretically, yeah, but it would be much harder to do. <clears throat> because if you remember an experiment with a fur and a plastic bag, the mm -hmm. mechanical interaction has led to electrons moved from these fur on a bag. Theoretically, some mechanical interaction makes those electrons move back. It's just mm -hmm. harder to do. Okay. Um, and then going back to conductors that are charged by induction. Does, can you actually move a charge like an electron over space from the object to the conductor? Or do we only talk about induction when there's like a conducting wire going to the ground? Over space, you mean like uh, through air? Yeah. Not in real conditions. It has to be something really, really strong. Okay. Um. If you would be adding using a, a very a powerful power source, for example, you would be adding more and more and more electrons. Eventually, you would have so many electrons. They would repel themselves so strongly that some electrons would start jumping away. But uh, that's unrealistic under regular circumstances. Okay. Um, and then my next question goes to the dipole that we put in an electric field. And we said that when friction exists, then the electric field is not zero. But no, that eventually... No, we didn't say that. You, you're making different statements. So when we have an electric field acting on the dipole, on the actual dipole, a stick with two charges. I think this was the situation. What I said is, if you had like a hand or a pivot here with friction, mm -hmm. eventually this dipole would stop in a certain configuration. And what would be that configuration? It would be parallel to the electric field. Yeah, but. Uh, there are two options, like this or like this. One is stable, one is unstable. So unstable is very unlikely. Which of these two configurations is stable? That's the question. And first one. The first one. 
So let's see what's going to happen if it's a little bit off. Oh, sorry, I meant the second one, right? Is the second one electric field points towards the negative charge? The second one. Well, again, again, technically what you should do is to imagine what's going to happen if uh, the system is slightly, slightly, just a little bit, not in equilibrium, deflected from equilibrium. And in this case, we know what should happen. Here, we, we should have a force acting like this and a force acting like this. So it, it actually will make this uh, type will move more and more away from equilibrium. But here, the force will act like this, like this. So it actually will make that will move back to the equilibrium. So this is stable, you're correct. Stable equilibrium. And this is unstable. So this will be the, uh, the final uh, orientation of this dipole. But if friction is zero, in that case, it would have to move forever, but it cannot spin. It can just rotate constantly. Because uh, when uh, uh, <coughs> a negative charge will be below this line, in that case, this force wants to bring it back. So in that case, with no, with no friction, it would have been just oscillating back and forth, back and forth. So my question comes from the stable configuration. Why is it that the charge cannot be, like the configuration has to be parallel to the field and it can't be perpendicular to the field? Well, I would like to draw, see your picture. You have to draw a picture. Your, uh -huh. pic your picture has to show electric field lines. Your picture has to show the dipole in the orientation of your choice. So. Uh, well, I know the stick, you want to be perpendicular, uh, which do you want to be positive, which do you want to be negative? Uh, top positive, bottom negative. All right. Now, you have, have force vector. Well, you have to draw force. You have to draw force on each, acting on each charge. So on a positive charge. How does it point? How, how does the force point? Downwards towards the negative charge. Or actually, no. If we're looking at each one separately, then for the positive charge, the force vector will point towards the right. <clears throat> well, technically, you're kind of right, because you should have asked the force acting on what from what. I'm not asking for a force acting from a negative charge on a positive charge. I'm asking, as you're right, uh, for, for the force acting on a positive charge from electric field. And how does the force acting on a negative charge from electric field point? Towards the left, opposite of the electric field. And where should I draw it? Should I draw it here? No, on the negative charge. So now you have to go back in time when you've been taking PY 105 course and you need to imagine what's going to happen with this device, if let's say it's attached, like in the middle, just for simplicity, to a nail and can spin, and you apply at the top force of the right and at the bottom you apply force of the left, what's going to happen? I would think that the forces cancel out. And you're left with, yeah, I think the forces cancel out. The net force acting on the system is always zero. No matter how we place it in the field, uh, what's happening, the net force is always zero. It's not about net force, because it's always zero. <clears throat> so net force doesn't make any difference. What makes difference? The question is to you. Again. Electric field? No. Again, I said it's 2i over 5. It's not 2i over 6. You've got mm -hmm. this device. And you simultaneously pushing to the right on the top, and uh, pushing on the bottom to the left. Take something like this, take a pencil, place it on the table, and push it. Use your fingers and push it, and look at it. What 
do we see? That's basically not pushing strong enough. Oh, it rotates. It does. It rotates. It means net torque. Have you learned about torque before? Mm -hmm. So that's what it is about. Net torque is not equal to zero. And net torque mm -hmm. is responsible for rotational motion. Well, in this situation, it is clockwise torque. The direction of a torque is clockwise in this situation, in the picture. That is why it is not equilibrium. That is why it will be spinning. I see. Okay. okay that That's PY one of five. And we will we will talk about torque in the future again, so you may kind of review it. Yeah, my TA um, is gonna go over it during his office hours on Wednesday. You got your own TA. No, my TA for this class or my TF, sorry. All right. More questions. Um. My next one is... Let me check how many students are waiting. Oh, we've got one more student. Let's uh, give another student a chance to ask a question as well. Okay. And then we come back. Okay, next student, next question, please. Me too. Okay. 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 Now better, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm working a bit ahead on homework number two. Um, I guess I don't know how far ahead it is. But number 10 for homework part two. It's, uh, uh, it's current, okay. Oh, wrong, wrong. I need 106, I need 106. I need homework, this one. Okay, mm -hmm. and which problem? Number 10. It's not actually ahead. We practically, uh, if, if it wasn't for technical difficulties, I would finish this today. Okay. okay All right. Guys. Let me first uh, make a copy of this so I could see it and write. So did you uh, check the equations for capacitors in parallel and in series? Yeah, so um, let me grab those real quick again. But in series, it just adds, right? Like the distance increases. So um, well, it's one <clears throat> over. There are two questions, well, yeah. actually three. What, why, and how? So. Right. In this situation, you're solving a problem, so it doesn't matter why. What matters is what to do and, uh, well, how to apply it. If you have right. two capacitors connected in series, in that case, you use uh, inverse capacitance. Mm -hmm. This is just something you need to remember, right? Right. And if you have two capacitors connected in parallel, the equivalent capacitance is just the sum. Right. This is what I will cover tomorrow right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But you know that already. Mm -hmm. The question is now how to apply it. Right. If you look at this system, you need to make a statement about, well, this is still three. Three different pairs of capacitors. C1, C2, C1, C3, C2, C3. And for mm -hmm. each, you have to make a statement. What choices do you have? You only have three choices. <clears throat> Capacitors may be connected uh, in parallel, in series. I don't know what symbol. There is no symbol. I need to invent. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. And neither. Mm -hmm. These are all the options. So for each of these, three players, you have to make a statement. Mm -hmm. So, C1 and C2, can you say something about them? How? C1 and C2. Oh. Yes, C1 and C2. They're parallel. Parallel. 
So the additive. So you, <clears throat> you're correct. What about uh, C1 and the C3? So they're in series? No. Well, with no. C1 and C2. C1 so like, and C2 are in parallel, as you said, and that yeah. is correct. But you made a very common mistake. C1 and C3 are neither. Oh, okay. If you could take scissors and cut this wire and remove C2, that would make C1 and C3 in series. But by adding an extra element, you break this connection into nothing. It's, mm -hmm. it's neither. So okay. you cannot use it. 